definitely keep our quorum going. So a Rainer? hybrid would be my preference. Okay, Raynard, what about you? I, I prefer the hybrid, Mike. That's, it provides more flexibility and it seems like that's what the group prefers too. So I'm in favor of that. Yvonne? Uh, I would agree with the, the group. I think a hybrid option would be great. I think being able to get back into some face-to-face -face, uh, sessions would be beneficial. But uh, I support the hybrid because sometimes the travel uh, and summer traveling distance can be a hindrance. Yeah. I think we're all in agreement from the committee members that that uh, uh, because of travel constraints that at least in my case that we will uh, I, I will be attending most meetings virtually rather in person because it's a three hour round, uh, a drive for me each way uh, but that I'd like to have the option because uh, conceivably there's going to be something coming up uh, that we would want to be there in person and have a, uh, uh, a more intense uh, interaction between, between the people. I, I will say that, again, we're, we're kind of digging into the uh, impact of the new legislation. Um, we cannot, if we do a hybrid, it means the in-person location has to be able to um, accommodate anybody who wants to attend in person. So we couldn't limit it um, to just the TAC members and BMS staff, uh, we would have to make sure that it could accommodate anybody who would want to attend in person. Um, I think that's kind of been our uh, concern is that's hard to uh, forecast, um, especially, you know, because we haven't met in person in a couple of years. So um, we, we have some sense of how um, attendance at, at previous TACs when we were in person um, but not really having an idea of what it would be like um, once we allow that to happen. So um, uh, we can work um, and to try to find a location to do a hybrid in the next meeting if, if, that, if that's the desire um, of the TAC, and then we can keep you updated uh, if we're having any, any issues with that. Perhaps we uh, uh, need to be called on and... and and respond with our intent, whether we will be present in person or virtually to help you all with your planning. Uh, I saw a note from Molly, I thought, Mike, uh, I don't know if you saw that about hosting, so. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, so how many, yeah. how many could KPCA hold as far as that's what the note was about now. Do what? I believe my located KPCA might be willing to host, but I don't want to speak yeah. for it. We can just get together with um, Veronica and Aaron and see if that's an option. That'd be great. We can work Talk on that. To logistics if that works. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's like we have 47 participants right now. Yeah. Okay. Sound. Of course, we wouldn't have that many attend. Oh. I, sure. I had to leave the there back on. All right. So we'll we'll Sorry. let. Uh, <laughs> might want to mute Molly. You're whispering. That was broken. <laughs> uh, Turn yours back on. Molly, did, I'm I'm hearing you. You're whispering and and open. Do you have something you want to say? I don't mean to cut you off. I think she was looking for the mute. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. Uh, so we'll we'll let KPCA and DMS discuss that, and we can take that up next time. Then uh, let's go to four C. The update on the provider signature time, which is uh, the fact that KPC or, or excuse me that FQACs and RH, uh, uh Cs are required to report on the day of the visit and, and other entities have three days and the department's intent to uh, uh, make that consistent at three days. I have some good news. <laughs> uh, we actually did file regulations last week. 
Uh, so they are um, starting the process. They've been filed. Um, and it does take about eight months to get through the entire process, but uh, at least it's on its way. Um, and then in the meantime, I think what we have shared is that the department is not um, um, uh, enforcing that particular uh, provision um, so that we can ensure that every, every, all the provider types are aligned. Okay, that's great. Great news. Okay. Veronica, what is the regulation that you're calling for? It was 90, it is 907 1082. Thank you. All right. And uh, the next thing on the agenda at 4D is the update on same day visits. Uh, uh, Veronica, you're up again. Sure. Um, so the department <clears throat> continues to work with its vendor, Myers and Stauffer, to um, research um, in a little more detail how other states um, uh, reimburse for same day visits. Um, so they have looked at multiple states um, gathered some information, trying to do some modeling. Um, and uh, we did meet with a particular provider to get some information about how um, um, they, you know, it currently works with, for them for a, another state where they do have multiple, um, uh, reimbursed for multiple visits in a day. So we are continuing to work on it. Um, and, you know, certainly we'll continue to provide an update on, um, on you know, our findings as soon as we have, a, I think, uh, more information to share. She's got to present those, so she's got to use her slides. Use her slides on her computer. So we still need some. Sorry, I didn't get figured out. Never mind. Uh, Ms. Yegan, would you, would you care to repeat your comment? I, I did not hear, and I don't think Veronica was able to hear you either. Is there any questions about um, or comments about that? Okay, so we'll leave that on the agenda for next time. Uh, then that finishes up old business, and we're going to go to uh, uh, new businesses. There's a first thing is a presentation under 5A level of support for primary care, and uh, it deals with the uh, extensive uh, handout uh, that was available to us. Uh, I believe that uh, Molly Lewis will be uh, handling that. Is that correct, Molly? Mike, we're we're having technical difficulties right now. Can we move that to the next agenda item and come back? Sure, sure. So let's skip to uh, uh, 5B, the shortage of dental services and outdated uh, dental fee schedules. And that's actually two items. One is a shortage of dental services, and the other is dealing with the uh, uh, outdated dental fee schedules, uh, leaving uh, the, that as being uh, or not being competitive. And I think Ashley Gibson is going to be addressing that. Yes, good morning. Thank you all for having me. Um, I am Ashley Gibson. I'm the Workforce Program Manager with the Kentucky Primary Care Association. So um, as part of my job, I work with our members to um, retain the workforce that they have today. So that's through loan repayment, um, burnout prevention resources, and then initiatives to help plan for the workforce of tomorrow and into the future. So working with students and getting pipeline program activities in place. Um, to, to make sure that we have those positions um, when needed. Um, and as part of, as part of uh, 
working on our workforce. I, I am the staff member that gets the call when there's a member that's having a hard time staffing a position. Um, and I, I'm just here to tell you, I'm getting a lot of calls about dental positions. There is a, a large dental shortage that we're seeing among our members. Um, right now, um, I have on my list right here, 13 dental openings that I've had, I've had members call and ask for support with. Um, I reached out to the primary care office that manages the um, HIPSAs, the designated shortage areas in our state, um, to, to see what we're currently at in terms of dental shortages. So they're doing a, a large review of HIPSA designations. Um, and right now, we have 90 counties designated as dental shortage areas. So that's 75% of our counties. Um, and, and I expect once this um, review is finished that we may see that number grow. And, and when you look at the map, and once that map is finished and they finalize that review, I'm happy to, to provide that. Um, you'll see it, it's very mal distributed into our rural areas, into the corners of our state, um, because our two dental schools are in, in Lexington and Louisville. Um, so many of, our, many of our members train students, many of our members are training dental students, but um, even at that, it, it's not enough. Um, and, and even, you know, I, again, I get to hear these stories from our members. I, I just heard yesterday um, of a, a dental student in their last year that's under contract with a member that's being poached because it's just, just that competitive. Um, so I'm just here to serve as a resource. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and if there's anything we can do together to try to um, increase the uh, dental workforce, I'm, I'm happy to happy to help with that. Um, and I, I just want to make sure to add, I know I, I spoke mostly about dentists, but um, the, the shortages go past dentists into dental hygienists, dental assistants. We're just seeing a, a large shortage of, of dental providers overall um, within our state. And I'm happy Rain. to answer any questions. And I think, I think Teresa maybe was going to talk about the dental fee schedule, if she's able to. Before we get into the fee schedule, let's talk. Let's see if there's any questions concerning the uh, shortage. Uh, Raynard, I would think that this uh, might be something you want to weigh in on. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to make some comments. Uh, I, guess, I feel like I've spent 40 years working on this problem and it's getting worse. So I don't know what that says about uh, <laughs> my contributions, but uh, there's no doubt that that's the case. Uh, when I think about this, I separated out into uh, several categories. Uh, uh, the, the first being the practicing dental profession. The second being uh, the safety net programs like community health centers and public health departments. Uh, the third being medical and dental education problem. And the fourth being problem with managed care policies and, and the incentives and reimbursements. Uh, and I further tend to divide it. I go back to the what we used to call the dental education wars of the 1980s and 1990s. In the early 1990s, the state, uh, through official policies of Council on Higher Education and, and the legislature, capped in-state dental enrollment. And they specified it to be 36 for the University of Kentucky and 44 to University of Louisville. And they opened up out-of-state enrollment. And that essentially uh, put us down the road to privatization. And that's the genesis of the, a lot of the shortages that you're seeing today. Uh, so there probably needs to be at a, at a higher level, somebody's bleeding over uh an examination of enrollment policies and incentives and, and, and the funding of dental education in the state uh so that was a root, so that was a root and we're um, just, I, I don't know why i'm picking up molly i'm i'm seeing that you're not muted uh okay now try it right okay so that was the uh that's, that's the root cause, and this has been years, decades in the making, and it's just, uh, it's now uh, reached a crisis stage. Now, when you look at the practicing profession, this is a result of the 
the profession's desire to stay separate and apart from the basic medical care system. The only place you really have integration is in the community health sector where you have co-location of services. And so what we have now in Kentucky, and I tend to separate this out into general dentists and dental specialists, is you have only the last time I looked at it, and this data needs to be updated, and Veronica, in particular, I know there's been efforts to try to share Medicaid data with the university so they could do some further study of this problem. And I don't know where that stands, but I would like to see that really reactivated again because we're kind of flying blind without uh, current information on this. But going back to the issue uh, of uh, private practitioners participation. When I looked at it the last time, there was only 400 of 2000 practicing, pra practicing dentists in Kentucky actually participating in the Medicaid program. That's about 20%. And that's at any meaningful level. I know what the registration shows. It shows up 800 or 1000 but that's a very uh, misleading figure because the actual participation is far, far less uh, than that. And I believe that could be verified. That gets further compounded when you look at the specialists who are in short supply anyway. They do participate at much higher levels, but their capacity is limited because their, their numbers are limited. So what you're seeing is, uh, the outcome of this, these two, two factors uh, have combined that uh, there's real shortages. Now on the dental education side, again, going back, the students are graduating with heavy levels of educational debt. And so tying it back to the reimbursement issues and managed care, uh, many of them don't see that it's economically viable to practice in the shortage areas in rural Kentucky. That's as simple as I can put it. And the corporate uh, providers are, are paying much higher uh, bounties to help them reduce their educational debt or they're going out of state. Uh, and so it's a real, it's a longstanding problem that has many aspects to it. It's not a, there's not a simple solution uh, governor Bashir actually asked me to work on it. This is the first Governor Bashir, Steve Bashir, and we did rather exhaustively and came up with a whole set of documents and policy recommendations. And we were well on our way to trying to address some of these in a substantive way when Governor Bevan canceled, canceled all of it, when you had a change of politics. So politics has been the primary reason, I believe, that we're in this situation we're in. And I'll, I'll just stop, but I'm happy to elaborate on it. But this thing has been studied to death. We have mounds and mounds of information about the nature of the problem. We know that the dental reimbursement rates are out of date and that there have been millions and, and millions, you know, uh, carved off the, the dental budgets. So this is a major, it's a major issue. It's not going to, there's no simple solution. Uh, it's going to take some long-term policy revisions and some revisiting of, of a lot of things. And with the support now for higher education and education in general in Kentucky, I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic about the, the you know, uh, where we might be able to go. But at the same time, you don't not work on it. You, you, you know, you go back and you, you, you try again. And I will have to say, that most of the access to dental care among the general dentist community in Kentucky is now being provided to the primary care association. A good portion of it. Significant improvements in access and the, the association has made a tremendous effort to improve its dental services. But it's still a major problem because they only represent a small fraction you know, of the practicing dentists in the state of Kentucky that could actually help with this problem. We know what works. Uh, we just haven't implemented it in Kentucky. So 
I'll stop. What when you say you, we know what works, uh, what would that be? Prevention works. Increase your, increase use of auxiliaries work. Care coordination works. Uh, higher reimbursement rates uh, to some extent uh, marginally work, but they usually don't pull up pull in any more dentists into the participating group. They just maintain the group that you've got. Uh, loan forgiveness works. Uh, uh, the integration of, of care in co-located sites works. All of those are options that we know work, uh, Mike, <laughs> but uh, uh, we haven't found the will to fund uh, programs uh, appropriately uh, to apply those things in practice. And we've, we made starts and then we stop and we recycle and we start and we recycle and we start and we recycle. And we were making a pretty concerted effort under this year with public health dental hygienists and health departments and primary care centers to actually try to implement some of these, these policies. And, you know, it all got wiped out or most of it got wiped out. And we know the situation that our health departments have been in with the, you know, retirement funds and the crisis that they faced in funding before COVID hit. And to some extent that's been relieved and, you know, they're funded a little better now. And I don't know how that'll be for the long term, but dentistry has always been a stepchild with mental behavioral health. Uh, in terms of, of how it's been addressed. And uh, I don't mean to, uh, to cry about that, but the reality is that's, that's been the situation in terms of funding. Um, I'm happy, I don't wanna bore, bore the group, but I mean, that's a realistic assessment of kind of where we stand, I think. It's gonna take money to correct uh, some of the problem. And a lot of the issues are gonna take long-term reversals of current policy before you're gonna see any improvement. Now you can work on it on the margins and we should. Mike, this is Chris, I have a question. Uh, my, actually, my question is for Ashley from the KPCA. Is she still on? Yes, I'm here, Chris. Hi, Ashley. I guess uh, you mentioned the two dental schools in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Has the KPCA, you know, uh, contacted the schools? I guess I'm curious, one, how many uh, licensed dentists graduate from their programs, whether is it annually or, you know, twice a semester? I'm not quite sure how the, the school system works for dentists. So when they come out and they're ready to practice, and are they, um, you know, what percentage that is that are coming out are Kentucky, you know, born and bred and, and hopefully will be working in Kentucky. I guess I'm just curious as to how that flow of that potential workforce is looking. You know, are they students that are graduating? Are they from other states and then they go back to their own state? So I guess, you know, uh, if that was something that the KPCA new or could look into? Yeah, so uh, you bring up a really good point, Chris. So I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me and that's something I, I will try to get um, and share with you all. But I do know that both of the dental schools in Kentucky um, take a higher rate of out-of-state students than we would like to see and they do return to their home state. There were some um, academic politics in play there. Um, you know, tuition is a little bit higher, not a little bit, significantly higher for out-of-state students. So um, we do see a higher rate of out-of-state students coming to Kentucky for dental school and then returning home. Okay. And I, I wanted to touch on, Rainer, you mentioned loan repayment um, as something that works and, um, loan you know, for loan forgiveness, right, loan forgiveness. So, um, you know, all of our dentists that are in RHCs and FQs are eligible for National Health Service Corps and Kentucky State loan repayment. Um, but one of the, the issues that, that we've seen in the last couple of years is they have to be fully licensed before they're eligible for those dollars. Um, and so some members are trying to recruit dentists, obviously, in their last couple of years of dental school, and they can't offer that carrot yet. You know, they, they're able to say, well, after you're with us, you know, for some time, you'll be able to apply, but the, the windows for application aren't matching up with what our members need. 
Um, and there was some new loan forgiveness payment, some new loan forgiveness funding that came out of this last legislative session. And myself and, and Rachel and Doug Hogan um, met with a team that's going to be managing that. And we raised the issue that it would be nice if they could offer that um, earlier so that members could use that to recruit while they're still in school. Okay, I'd like to speak to what Chris raised just briefly. Uh, Chris, uh, uh, the last time I looked at it uh, at the University of Kentucky, the enrollment was in the, the, like the low 60s and 36 of those were in-state. Okay, and that's, uh, for a long time, we were at 50, 14 out of state and, and 36 in-state kept by the state. The University of Louisville uh, was kept at a different level. Uh, they had uh, 44 in states, but their enrollment uh, was in the, the 80s and now I believe exceeds 100, and 100 to some extent. And I, I haven't, don't have those current figures myself either. If you'd asked me three years ago, I could have told you specifically, but the proportions are much different. And that's a reflection of the fact that dental education has essentially been privatized using out-of-state tuition. Mm -hmm. the, the schools are dependent on generating clinical income or out-of-state tuition to maintain the current, their current numbers of graduates. And that's the reality. And that forces up uh, student debt and that that's that's the vicious cycle that was started. Uh, it was a compromise reached to save two dental schools in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And nothing's been changed since then. And so that's the reality of what we're living with. So actually, uh, I saw in the chat again, I think we know that a dentist and hygienist are eligible to apply for through the National Health Service Corps, you know, is that information something that the KPCA uh, in uh, talking about potential workforce is uh, communicating to the schools about that, you know, again, consider looking into rural communities or communities that have a, a, a high HIPSA score for, you know, for shortages for dentists to, you know, I mean, you know, to at least start their practice, I, you know, I don't, I don't know um, if graduating dentists, you know, are, you know, ha, you know, who are they recruited by, uh, you know, established practices who are looking to expand in their state or the state they come from, or, you know, um, you know, is there a, uh, a headhunter for, uh, for dentists? And if there are groups of headhunters, maybe, um, you know, do are they aware of uh, incentives such as the National Health Service Corps to, to that they can then share as well when they're looking for dentists? You know, I'm not I'm not too familiar with the process for you know uh, headhunters uh, as there are as it relates to uh, physician recruiting. You know that type of thing. Absolutely, yeah. That's that's also a great point, Chris. So yes, I I work uh, especially close with UK. We have a partner there called the Kentucky Medical Professions Placement Services that gets us access to um, medical students and dental students. And additionally, if they move on to residency, we're able to work with them too. And um, every opportunity I can to to talk to dental and medical students. I'm always advocating National Service Corps, Kentucky State Loan Repayment, um, you know, talking about the benefits that are available in our health center. So anytime I can get an audience, I, I definitely bring that up. Um, I, I'd love to be able to get more access to them, but um, I, I do at, at least once a year um, meet with these groups and talk about loan repayment and the options. Yeah, I, I think this conversation is good. Just so that, uh, again, so that uh, the state can can appreciate and hear firsthand mm -hmm. that there are these shortages because, you know, we all know how dental care and primary care, you know, as far as if, if you, if your, if your mouth fails in regard to keeping it healthy, that that can exacerbate, um, you know, um, diabetes and other, other, you know, um, medical issues as well. And so, you know, we're, Kentucky is trying to improve access to dental and our um, uh, 
uh, what score of, of having a state that has a high number of people with no teeth or toothlessness and indentialism, we have a high rate of that, you know, uh, we're not going to be able to address that and work on those kind of improvements if staffing issue, workforce issue uh, continues. So mm -hmm. let, let me step in here then. And, and uh, there's a second part of this, the outdated dental fee schedules. Uh, was there someone that was wanting to speak to that? Me. Um, I don't think I'm the person on the agenda to speak to that, but I do think that it's a important thing to take into consideration that um, in addition to having the workforce stay in Kentucky in the dental space, it's also um, the next part of that equation is to the participation in the Medicaid program. Right now, it's just not very appetizing. Um, or does it make a lot of business sense um, for dentists in Kentucky to take care of Medicaid patients? Um, and then the complications of dealing with subcontractors of the MCOs, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of administrative burden um, and it's just a low, it's, it, if they can fill their chair with a patient that has commercial insurance versus, or private insurance versus a patient who has Medicaid insurance, um, the incentives are pretty clear. Uh, comment, Rainer. Uh, I would bet my shirt that there is non-equity between medical and behavioral health and dental reimbursement uh, among the MCOs. And so I, I would, would bet if an analysis and a, a careful, thoughtful analysis was done, that there's not equity among the very the way reimbursement is being handled across those three three uh, areas that need to be coordinated in the primary care sector. Well, I, what I'm okay. seeing here is a uh, situation. I know in our in our uh, uh, organization, I'd like to have available four to six uh, dentists to hire over the next twelve months, uh, but uh, it's not out there and. Uh, uh, for a lot, a lot of factors is, is completely, uh, the landscape has changed about recruiting dentists if you can find them. And, and one thing's not to add is, is the, uh, organizations that have cropped up, uh, where they hired, uh, dentists, they're doing a cash basis, uh, uh, cherry picking, if you will. And, um, uh, is, is uh, taking a lot of the dentist that you would have available out of it for joining these type of organizations. Uh, and that's just changing landscape. But what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing the, the genesis for a recommendation to the MAC to undertake uh, to, to resolve to, to work on this issue and make recommendations. Uh, and, and I'm not sure exactly how that should be worded. Uh, perhaps one of you, perhaps Raynard, might want to uh, see how we could bring this to the max attention and ask for their uh, input and, and, uh, and uh, upgrading these things. So uh, think about it between now and the end of the meeting when we get to that part and uh, see see if you all agree that, that this should be a recommendation to the MAC to undertake this. Uh, Mike, I, I'll try right, right away. I'd okay. like to see a recommendation that the MAC work with the Office of Health Policy in the cabinet. And, you know, that uh, that's uh, to, to uh, study uh, that issue and make definitive policy recommendations to address work for workforce shortages, dental enrollment levels, and reimbursement for dental services. In other words, I'd like to see a real good policy effort made at the level, by the cabinet, not just referring it to the MAC, but internally to, to study this issue just like they have the RAP payments. Okay. All right, so let's let's go on at this point and then revisit it later in the agenda when we talk about recommendation to the MAC then. Uh, 
having said that, uh, is uh, uh, the primary care uh, collaborative, uh, Molly Lewis. Are you ready to do that presentation at this time? Yes, um, thank, thank you, Mike. Um, I've got some slides. Molly, you're muted if you're talking. Molly, we cannot hear you. I think they're working on it, Mike. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It won't let me share the slides and talk at the same time. Um, hold on. Do you want to try to email those to me and I can share while you go through them? Yeah, that'd be great. Aaron. Go up to the slides and then I don't know what that new feature is that you can't talk and share at the same time. Okay. Can you go to, go to share? It's Okay, it's coming from drill in to ER IN. Yeah, I can work it. Okay, see if this works. Hmm. A link. Okay. You get it, Aaron? Aaron, did you get the email? I did. I'm sorry. I lost everybody while I was trying to get it open. Give me just a second while it opens. Thank you so much. You're very so, welcome. Like, like I said, we've been talking a lot here at the office about primary care, um, what it is, what the investment is, what the way that the contracts are structured, where the incentives are, and just how we continue to live out um, the mission of the KPCA to improve access to primary care. And there are two reports that we think are really helpful. Okay, yeah. So I have my notes if you just wanna do like the full slideshow thing. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, perfect. If you push slideshow, then it might, it can be bigger, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Can you? There you go. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so next, that was just a, I love the New Yorker cartoons. Um, so here, Erin, I think you'll have to push it a couple times to get through. As you know, KPCA, we want um, re all Kentucky residents to have access to comprehensive patient-centered care. And it comes down to um, coming together as essentially a network of similarly oriented um, providers who have this initiative. And that's how we try and help support them. So you can go through the values and then we can go to the next one. I think you just have to click enter a bunch several times. Yeah. Just blip on through that. Okay. So a lot of what we try and do is create learning collaboratives um, and then collective efforts to move forward in that agenda. Um, as you all know, we were founded in 1976. Um, most of our members are either um, community health centers or what are known as federally qualified health centers, rural health clinics, and then similarly oriented primary care providers, which generally are in underserved areas. Um, something that we have done uh, for quite some time and it continues to evolve is we provide a, one of our member services is for the um, members to come together and um, jointly contract with um, payors. And we've moved from what was the messenger model, which was a tightly regulated way where we were just, you know, delivering the message. Do you, you know, this is the offer, do you accept it? This is the, no, this is our counter offer. To moving towards more of a clinically integrated network where we have more engagement and more um, clinical leadership in helping to improve quality um, and help move the needle. Okay, next. So there's this study that came out um, a couple years ago and it was by the Primary Care Collaborative. And what they looked at were trends in private insurance. Um, so this was for, um, they looked at the total spend and that was for all individuals who had private healthcare plans. Um, this was, they were either fully insured or self-insured and it included also employer sponsored plans. Um, and it, it, the, what was considered cost or spend was um, all allowed costs, including co-pays. And if you, and if they looked at every state and if for Kentucky, for the way that money is spent on healthcare expenses, 3.14% was on primary care. Um, so that meant that 3.14% of all the money that was spent on healthcare went towards um, healthcare services delivered by family um, healthcare providers, internal medicine, um, pediatrics, general practitioners, really, but just that um, MD, DO level of care. If, and we were 50 out of 50. So that meant Kentucky had the lowest investment in primary care for private insurance. Um, but if you looked at a broader scope of what primary care is and you start to think about um, a more diverse scope of workforce to include nurse practitioners and PAs and then a, you know, a wider range, we were actually did a better job. So we were 22 out of the 50 states. So what we take away from that is that um, while our workforce and our utilization is limited. If you have a, a broader scope, obviously we do a better job compared to other states. Next. So this is pretty interesting. We realized that in that study um, for the, of the private insured, primary care utilization decreased 24% from 2008 to 2016. Um, but specialist visits remained flat or increased and urgent care visits increased um, for problem-based care. So what does this mean? And how are we, how are we responding? It's, it seems to mean that the patients, the utilization is for primary care is going down and we need to figure out why. Is there anything else, Dr. Hoagland? You wanna to add to that? Um, and you would also think about primary care, you know, it, there was a limited, there was less of a workforce, um, more people were at home, there were shorter hours, um, essential 
there were stay at home orders, a lot of people deferred access to care, but, um, but those types of trends didn't apply to specialty care access. Next. So then you look at what, um, and this is just a sh short, um, I mean, this is limited, but it, it kind of paints the picture. So if you looked at what Kentucky's federally qualified health centers and lookalikes, what their payor mix is like, then the information that we just showed about private insurance um, is just about 30%, you know, less than a third of the types of patients that are cared for in the underserved areas. So uh, next. So it, we, we were interested in seeing what the, what the rest of the story is. Um, safety net providers are what we like to, our, our network, um, the way that the contracts work, they're responsible for 100% of the healthcare costs of their patient serve. So regardless, so when you think about where money is being spent and how um, payments are being, how payer relationships are working, there's a tremendous responsibility. Next to make sure that the patients are cared for in the most highest quality, um, low cost or you know, cost effective way. So what do we need to do? Primary care is proven to be um, the access point or the gateway um, for um, help for primary care. So patients with the, the greater primary care spend have less avoidable hospital visits. So um, we need to have better patient outcomes, greater equity, and more efficient use of healthcare resources. And how do we orient towards primary care to get there? Next. So in the value-based proposition, which we talk about all the time, value equals quality over cost. And you can't get the way that that's demonstrated or measured. Um, the first thing to do is to control cost and then to you're incentivized to deliver higher quality as it's measured. Next. But the interesting part is, is that you, the United States spends more money on, um, US spends its money on healthcare, not health. So we need to change, like I said, the compass of the perspective. Because if you look at that person on the left-hand side, what makes us healthy, about 10% is, is access to healthcare. And then so much more of it are other contributions. And, but we spend 90% of the costs are on medical services and not very much is spent on preventative or primary, you know, on actual things that determine health. Next. And this is just something from a while ago um, in the Herald Leader showing here in Kentucky where if you look at access to healthcare in terms of life expectancy, um, it, it's greatly determined by where the services are and how, they're be, and how they're being delivered. So like, for example, you see life expectancy is 78 in Fayette County, 78 years old, whereas Wolf County, which is just an hour east, is 70 years. So what's the difference? Next. Um, and this is another part showing that our outcomes, um, if you look at, for example, premature deaths or birth weight or adults' days of not feeling good, how does that reflect where primary care is being delivered and how it's being delivered? And I guess it's not just where the care is, it's how it's being utilized and where the incentives are to utilize it better. So like I said, healthcare is about more than just, you know, the doctor's visit. It has to do with taking care of the whole patient. Um, and we call these social determinants of health. You know, so much of how we access healthcare, where patients feel empowered to show up, has to do with social determinants of health. Next. Next. Um, so while there used to be this concept, and you all have heard David Bolt say this a lot, um, or treat them and street them, where you were trying to, it was very volume driven. Now it's more of a comprehensive approach to make sure be, that the patient 
that once you get the patient in the door, you deal with transportation, scheduling, um, making the patient feel um, empowered to ask questions and access care. You wanna really capitalize on that visit to take care of the whole patient. And during that visit, you can do a lot for a little cost um, and, and hopefully avoid some of the bigger costs in terms of hospital visits. Next. Um, and Kentucky, as you all know, the General Assembly, when they were asked Medicaid for the spend, I think that Kentucky's um, numbers showed that if you looked at federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics, it was about 2.9% spent on primary care. So that reflects what those private insurance um, claims data showed as well, is that we're not, um, we're not spending money on on preventative and comprehensive health services that can control and change the narrative for the health of Kentuckians. Next. You can keep going, it's just, it's gonna be up to several things. So this is just about making, having better coordinated care, having, being creative. What do you do to get the patient there and help take care of them in a compassionate and comprehensive and coordinated way? Um, Things like access, having broader hours of operation, transportation to get there, front desk training so that the patient feels comfortable um, showing up and making the most of the visit, having call centers so that the patient doesn't feel like they need to go to the emergency room, but they have, can ask some questions before and better understand what the resources are. Um, using telehealth when it's appropriate, um, helping patients get access to insurance or different benefits, um, even SNAP, food stamps, that sort of thing. And then trauma-informed care. So that's not just one question, but you're asking, um, you know, you're going five questions deep to really understand what's going on with the patient and how to take care of them. These are the types of things that you don't get paid for, but they make a big difference. Um, having a, Using um, informed care, for example, our investment in trying to help better um, use the health information, connecting with the immunization registry, and everything that's necessary in order to really capitalize on that visit and understand what's going on with the patient, um, regardless of where they've accessed care, so that the um, provider can um, be comprehensive in that visit. Um, having labs on site, um, medication management, using community health workers, having specialists, um, even a part of an FTE to go there. Um, to the clinic so that they can access there and not have to drive to Lexington or Louisville. Um, we try and do that also, kind of what we were talking about earlier, to support the workforce and help individuals want to go to the area so that we don't have as many discrepancies as those maps initially showed um, and where care can be accessed. Next. Is that it? Um, so, as Ashley and Mike and Rainer were talking about, workforce development is key, health information is key so that we know if the patient got a vaccine at Kroger or if they got a patient at, at another clinic, you know, how to better coordinate health information um, so that the best, the highest value can be delivered. Um, having a good attitude about primary care, maybe shifting where, what people think about going to the doctor and um, addressing healthcare needs before they become something that deliver them in the emergency room. I think that's it. I kind of rushed through it, but um, we just thought that it was really interesting that, that while the private claims data shows that there's about a 3% investment in primary care, um, the Medicaid information actually shows that it's about exactly the same. So we're not really investing much in primary care, but that and, but the costs are coming from something else. And maybe if we invested more in primary care, we could avoid some of those costs. Do y'all have any questions? All right, any questions for Molly? This is Chris, I do. Sure. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, great, great presentation, really good information. Uh, I guess my question is, so, what would you suggest? I mean, if, if the, um, the information shows that not enough money is being spent on primary care, then where does that take place? Uh, at the state level or, or what? Uh, your thoughts on that? 
Um, a couple things. I think one of it has to do with patient engagement and having connecting the patients with the right provider um, where they will consider it as a, you know, a point of kind of the medical home where the patients will want to go to address issues and they feel comfortable that it's not something that they dread and avoid, but so to help improve access to preventative care and just, um, and then also how we use the workforce. Their um, use of community health workers, different types of workers in a re that so that um, the clinics can support the workforce that's appropriate for all different aspects of care that take care of the whole patient. So I, I think that the social determinants of health and some of the issues that drive so much of how we utilize healthcare um, can be addressed with um, resources outside of the highest level of expertise. So like the physicians, nurses, those if we had a more approach that the face-to-face -face wasn't the ultimate, a face-to-face -face with a high level provider wasn't the ultimate way of payment, that if we had a more comprehensive understanding of what services are being delivered and um, how patients are encouraged to be engaged. I think that the patient engagement is a key point. And Chris, you probably have a lot more um, thoughts on that from being boots on the ground, but um, if we can avoid the hospital visits, and then we can also encourage if the patient, you know, with discharge planning, for example, if the patient leaves the hospital, that they kind of are reoriented towards what they need to do to avoid future ones and to reconnect with their primary care doctor. Those are some of the ideas that we've been talking about. And, but Molly, you know, I, I guess, again, in overall spending of uh, dollars for primary care, FQs, you know, who receive a grant uh, to be an access point, you know, the, uh, you know, those grant dollars help them to cover the cost of those ancillary positions that you mentioned and everything. And so, you know, um, what, what, you know, what would the private practice world be doing in regard to, um, you know, I don't think they're motivated to, well, we're gonna hire one, a social worker or a community health worker or, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I can't bill for the service, if I can't get some reimbursement because, you know, um, I'm in it to make money. I guess, you know, from that's my perspective of the private practice setting, you know, and the role of the FQ is to, be good stewards of our grant dollars. And we tend to see that as we have to invest in staff and, and the right uh, resources for our communities and things like that. So, you know, I guess I'm, um, um, you know, still trying to look at, does it come down to additional reimbursement from, uh, you know, Medicaid if, those kind of services that are, are not reimbursable now become reimbursable, question mark. Yeah, and I asked Dr. Hoagland because he might have some perspective. Do you want sure. to share your thoughts? Yeah, I think there's several layers between uh, in your questions, uh, Chris, and comments. Um, uh, so obviously, I think the, the FQHCs, the RHCs sit in a really uh, special place in the in the care delivery system uh, in Kentucky in particular, uh, but just in general, they do. Uh, and yes, there are differences between how uh, private, private practices behave uh, than, the, uh, than the traditional safety net. And then there's also differences between those that are independent uh, or multi-specialty practices that are not attached to hospital systems and their behaviors. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, understanding each of those is important uh, when you look at primary care in general, uh, outside of the safety net, there's a lot more complexity uh, for them to be able to deliver some of those additional services that we do know make a big difference in health. Now, as the world is shifting away from a transactional fee-for-service code-based reimbursement model to a combination of that and a uh, you know, an, an incentive model that includes uh, performance and quality and value that is then brought back to uh, the providers, it starts changing a little bit. 
and you know, then really looking at how you're using the a total workforce in delivering healthcare and delivering health becomes a lot more viable for many groups, but it really still is targeting the larger groups uh, than the smaller ones. And so there's still a niche that I think they need some help with. Uh, but those value-based contracts will, I think, over time help uh, deliver value to a broader group or demonstrate value from a broader group than the safety net providers. And that's part of what we're working on with that, uh, with that niche. Um, other parts of the country have seen some real success uh, in uh, the private uh, world uh, through value-based contracts as well. Uh, and so we have, to, we have to work on getting there. Okay, let, let me step in. This, this is uh, really interesting and, and, and very timely information. However, if we're going to get you all out of here by 12 o'clock today, we're going to have to move on. We still have a lot of agenda there. So I apologize about cutting this short and be, be glad to take up a further discussion of it in, in the next meeting. Uh, but uh, at this time, I'm going to go to uh, New Business 5C, MCO Missed Appointment Information. And my notes, it shows that Yvonne Agan and, and Veronica Cecil will be commenting. And in the chat box, also, I saw that Kristen uh, Mauder with Humana will have some information on this, too. Uh, so, uh, Yvonne, would you like to start out this? Sure. This is, uh, it's, I think it's a in the complex of what we've just uh, talked about, I think it's pretty simple. So back in March, there was some disappointment reports that were sent out and it just spurred conversation among various clinics about what is this data? What is it used for? How is the data being captured at the Medicaid level? And uh, what is it important back to the clinics to know this information and should they be reporting their misappointments. So I just like some perspective from DMS on this topic um, so that we can get information back out. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, so the the reason we cre created the missed appointment reporting is, is actually through um, several discussions uh, with Mac and Tax about um, just uh, you know, feeling the need to make sure that uh, there's a way to track that. We cannot reimburse. It's, it, we're prohibited from reimbursing for a missed appointment. But um, what we agreed with is that what it could do is help um, identify an opportunity to do outreach to somebody. Is it, you know, transportation or child care? Um, and, and to try to see if, if uh, there could be some assistance provided to that person. So, um, the information does get sent to the MCOs and at the MAC, the MCOs have been reporting on this. Um, and so um, certainly I know time is limited, Mike, but I, I, I think what we had hoped is that the MCOs would have the opportunity to talk about how they're utilizing the information. And if we don't have time today, then maybe we could put it on a future agenda. I think we can move it to a future agenda. Uh, we have other uh, topics we need to move on to. Yes, I'd like to ask one question of Veronica. Does the MCO information include missed dental appointments? It does. Yep, it sure does. Okay, well, thank you. This is Chris. Just another quick question. How do they know there's been a missed appointment? Uh, so it has to be reported by the provider. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's the tool that we're, we're utilizing um, to help uh, drive that outreach. Veronica, am I correct in saying that the, you have to log on to Kentucky Health Net to report that? That's correct, yeah. And, and I understand um, it's an administrative burden, but um, it's the only way to capture it. Uh, we, have, um, we have some prolific providers uh, who are doing a really good job of, of reporting it every time. Um, it, you know, it's sporadic. And, and the other thing we try to capture from that is what the, you know, if the, if the member reported, you know, uh, or if the provider is able to obtain the reason, um, certainly we try to capture that. I know a lot of times you all don't know because it's just, they don't show up, but um, 
again, you know, we, we think it's a, it is a great tool to help um, generate some outreach. And it certainly is absolutely not about, um, you know, stigma or um, to, um, you know, it, 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 to have any kind of negative impact to a member because it, it, it doesn't affect the member, except that perhaps we can help, um, you know, and, and the MCOs can help try to figure out why that person isn't making the appointments, especially if we have evidence to show that they're not regularly meeting them. Kristen uh, Mauder from Humana, did you have something you were wanting to say on this? going going uh, oh sorry there you go can you hear me now okay. yes yeah. um i was going to do one of the mco presentations like veronica mentioned so i can just wait till whenever you put it on the next agenda all right it, yeah unless you want them to go ahead and do a short one it's up to you well you what's your pleasure christian it's up to you guys it sounds like you have a lot of <laughs> other items to go through so all right let's just uh bring this back up then at the next meeting is that all right then yes Bye. okay so uh uh let's go on to new business 5d reconciliation and this is the uh the old part of, of dealing with reconciliation on on the wrap uh some reason they got mine in your name, Veronica. I wonder why. Uh, but uh, uh, ladies first. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> um, and and actually, perhaps this will be moved up to old business. But um, I appreciate that it um, you know of, of the interest in it and, and wanting to have a conversation. Um, you know, one of the reasons for the creation of the work group. Um, was to uh, was out of I think the request to uh, do a, a reconciliation um, and and one that goes back numerous years. Uh, the department did one, um, and my memory is failing me, uh, many years ago, um, and um, and so I think you know there's there was has been interest in provider from providers in trying to do another one. Um, the work group um, and, and sort of my, I guess, goal has been to um, make sure that, you know, there are, there are reasons why um, there's, I think, uh, everyone feels the need to have one. And, and that's because of, you know, rec, the wraps not um, paying accurately or not generating a wrap. Um, and so the work group has been really focused on correcting the systems, um, finding uh, root causes, uh, addressing those, because there, there are three buckets. Um, there's how the provider submits the claim, that's how the MCO processes and submits the encounter, and then it's how our system um, um, generates the wrap. And so as you can imagine, when you have um, that complex of a, of a process that something's going to go wrong. Um, and so it, it's really been the focus to try to uh, correct a lot of that, to, um, to identify where the issues are and, and, and develop solutions for them um, so that we can feel a little more confident in the process working like it should. Um, a reconciliation, one thing is clear is that we can only pay a wrap on an encounter that so that we have evidence of, um, of the service you know, being rendered and paid um, and then um, to calculate the wrap appropriately. So, uh, you know, um, the discussion of a reconciliation, I think, is still a little premature as we work through those system issues, process issues, um, I really feel like, um, you know, we need to, we still have some work to do. Um, development of the reports, giving transparency to both providers and the MCOs, um, I think is, is critically important because that way everybody has the information and is able to 
um, walk through it and share and, and have discussions um, and um, on a provider level, try to resolve whatever particular issue is because it, it, it will be very provider specific. Um, so I think that's where we are. It is absolutely our intention to provide um, guidance again in, um, in you know, the changes that we're making related to um, RAP payments. Um, and then at some point, you know, I think, we'll, again, when we feel like pretty, pretty confident that things are working as, as best as, as they can, you know, nothing's going to get 100%. But, um, you know, I think at that point, then certainly uh, providers and, and MCOs could discuss how to, um, to resolve any of those issues for claims that might not have generated a wrap. Hey, at the uh, uh, last meeting, when we decided to split that, we uh, discussed uh, with you about developing a framework for reconciliation uh, and, and I'm hearing that that uh, that's still something that you all are working on. Uh, is that fair? That's fair. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's leave that on the agenda uh, for next time. There were some particular questions that uh, was placed on the agenda under reconciliation. Wow. I'm run through those. One, will they allow providers to submit claims back to 2011 with the inception of new reports? since there's already been a reconciliation on that period. I'd like to address that, please. Yeah, I, I don't, honestly, because um, I think there's gonna be a lot uh, that goes into um, what that process is gonna look like. I don't think I can address the questions. Okay. I just uh, don't have answers for them right now. All right, uh, well, the other, the other one was, uh, uh, I think uh, two there is who is the contact person providers should contact for reconciliation at DMS after they've run reports and went through MCO. Uh, do you have a particular person responsible for this? Uh, uh, no, again, I think that will, when, once we figure out the process, all that information will be provided. Okay. And that same thing then about DMS, has DMS developed a format to submit data? Right, it's uh, not developed yet. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, let me say that in the uh, 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 work group, the, the way that you all are, are uh, uh, tracking the issues and the responses is, is uh, very comprehensive and, and excellent, I think. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, going to new business 5E, require reimbursement for physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy for FQHCs and RHCs. Uh, Yvonne uh, is listed. Would you like to speak to that? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I just, we, this is a topic that came up. Uh, a few months back and uh, Veronica, I had reached out to you and for guidance. So when we're, when we're trying to find uh, any of the regulations regarding the use of physical therapists, occupational therapists, or speech therapists in an FQ and R an RHC setting, there seems to be a void of any public guidance on this. We did find uh, under K KAR 1054 and 1055 that provider types for physical therapists and occupational therapists were approved to be linked to uh, provider type 31. It does not make any mention to speech therapy, but in the communication that you were helping me with, you were able to provide codes back to me that you thought were eligible, or you telling us we're eligible for PPS and you were able to send back some PT codes and speech therapy codes. So I guess the question is, can we clean this up? Can we go back and look at this and have better uh, publications on the use of these types of uh, therapy 
in our RHGs and FQHCs. It seems to be a little void of information and maybe uh, it doesn't quite follow through in the typical format that we're used to working with. It, thanks for the question, Yvonne. It, it, this is one of those situations where the question seems easy, and so that makes me nervous. <laughs> as we, as we um, uh, dove into it with our uh, with Myers and Stauffer and, and internally, um, we were trying to figure out, um, you know, where I guess kind of what generated the question in terms of had you tried to bill for something and it got denied or you're just really wanting to make sure that you're in compliance with, with um, the ability to, to bill for those services. Um, as far as we know, um, and, and certainly, um, you know, we could try to provide something in writing. Um, it, it, this, uh, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy uh, should be services that are provided by an FQHC and RHC. Um, so um, I don't know, Lee, if I don't know if you have any, I'm gonna um, put you on the spot, but Lee guys, I don't know if you have any other um, thoughts on that as, as we kind of discussed it. I think it comes from the situation if you're considering, can you expand into these service issues? We're, we're trying to make, have assurance that it is a reimbursable, uh, Mm -hmm. service and when it's not clearly in writing it leaves some left up to interpretations so we're just trying to clarify it so uh, at a high level it is a reimbursable service uh, i want to make sure since you since you brought up the phrase uh change in scope of service uh, we are not answering that question now because oh, that that one. good yeah okay I just want to make sure uh, mm -hmm. but but yes uh, just from you know you have to make sure that you follow all the licensure requirements and right. um, and then you're fine what is high level Lee? at when a high said, level when you I said wanna... it's reversible at a or reimbursable at a high level what is high no level? I'm sorry I, I didn't, I meant uh, from a 30,000 foot view and not getting into the weeds of, is it a, is it a, um, a change in scope of, ser of service, you know, per the reimbursement, uh, the PPS regulations. So that, that's what I was trying to say about at a high level, not mm -hmm. at a higher rate or, or any of that. I just meant from a 30,000 foot view. Okay. okay? All right, uh, and my understanding is not reimbursable either. So uh, we definitely uh, need to have a clearer understanding of what is and isn't in regards to those, at least from my standpoint. Any other questions on that? All right. Any questions or other comments on that subject? Then let's go down to the new business 5F changes to telehealth upon expiration of public health emergency. Uh, Teresa Cooper, are you wanting to address this? Mike, the TAC had asked for an explanation from Medicaid um, of what they foresaw, if any, changes happening to telehealth when the public health emergency expired. So uh, I will defer to Veronica for that. Okay, so I thought, Veronica, we were leaving you out of one, but I guess not. I feel honored. Um, I, so... Um, Right now, I, I will have to say, you know, we filed the telehealth regulation and um, incorporated into that is a lot of the flexibilities that we uh, expanded under the public health emergency. Um, 
we we are required to defer to the Office of Civil Rights to um, on the platforms and um, the ultimate requirements around telehealth um, as a state Medicaid agency. The I think the only um, probably of most concern is going to be the the um, the platform that can be used. You know, right now. Um, you can use FaceTime and, um, and other platforms such as that, um, which is part of the, uh, the flexibility um, that's allowed under the PHE. When the PHE ends, that, those types of platforms will not be allowed. Um, so, but, but otherwise, you know, in terms of the services that can be delivered and who can deliver those services, um, what our telehealth regulation makes clear is that as long as the licensing board and professional standards and the um, correct coding guidelines permit that service to be delivered in um, through telehealth, then Medicaid would cover it um, that way. Does that help? Uh, I know that in my area, rural southeastern Kentucky, uh, communications is is a real problem, and and uh, uh, there's still many areas that that do not have internet service or do not have sufficient strength to be able to uh, do a uh, face to face, and the ability of of uh, especially among our older people to be able to use a telephone. Uh, uh, because it's an approved cost is, is very important. Uh, I think it would make a negative substantial difference if that, that goes away. That's just my comment. Uh, and it goes under the, for what it's worth category. Anyone else would like to have a comment or ask a question concerning this? I, I would agree with what Mark's saying. I think if we go too limited on what those platforms are, will it, it limit care to some patients that might otherwise not have that access? So I just want to make sure that we're considering the, those options. I will say that I, I think that we're uh, implementing um, uh, um, to, that increases it to the best of our ability. Um, we don't control uh, ultimately what the, um, you know, the platforms that are, are allowed to be used. Um, but I, I do believe we're leveraging and taking advantage of everyone that we can. Let, let me ask this question. Uh, it's hard to separate out because of the umbrella that COVID has affected us and ever walk of life, especially in healthcare. But these relaxed rules uh, about uh, telehealth, have they caused much of a difference in, in how much it costs the department to uh, provide this care through its Medicaid recipients? Um, we have pulled data about um, uh, the service, the expenditures and, um, of services, both through in-person and telehealth prior to the public health emergency and then since. Um, and, you know, I think what we have seen is that, um, which is, is a good thing, um, is that uh, expenditures have um, kind of, or, or services have kind of returned to normal with the use of telehealth. Um, where you see the decrease in in-person services, you've seen an increase in the telehealth. Um, so that to us at least demonstrates that, um, you know, ac access um, uh, to the extent that, you know, it's possible is, is there and available. Uh, we understand that there are some, um, some shortcomings to that, but, um, you know, that people are utilizing services through telehealth. Okay. Any other questions? Then let's let's move on to uh, uh, new business five H, which is MCO COVID nineteen member incentives of reference guide, and also under that uh, we will take up the individual reports 
of, of the uh, uh, MCOs, uh, but to start with uh, on the uh, uh, incentive reference guide and looking over it, and I think part of the reason that uh, DMS wanted to bring this forward is the fact that, that the incentives as listed have expired or will expire in the very near future. Uh, so maybe as we go through this, uh, MCOs can update us uh, as to uh, uh, what uh, their particular MCOs uh, is doing. Uh, have, have these benefits sunsetted or they've been renewed with the other uh, future expirations set or what? So, um, Mike, so, yeah. look, this is Angie Parker with Medicaid, just in the side of that, uh, or part of this. I did ask all the MCOs uh, earlier in the week or last week, seeing this on the agenda to update this guide, but obviously they can let you know, and we should have all of that updated by uh, by tomorrow and submitted out so that everybody will have an updated document on, on any changes that they're looking to provide. That'd be great. That'd be great. So let's start then uh, with Humana. Uh, Beth Day, you were uh, uh, speaking last time we met. Are, are you uh, representing Humana today or someone else going to speak up? Hey, Dr. Caldy, I sure am. This is Beth Day. Um, I did want to let you guys know that we do not have any set expiration forthcoming for the COVID incentive program that we have available. Um, we do offer all of our Medicaid members the opportunity to take advantage of the Go 365 program. And through that, they do accrue rewards for any kind of healthy behaviors that they make. Uh, they can connect fitness trackers or their phone in order to track their steps, and they get rewards for that, along with um, other uh, uh, healthy activities, such as getting their immunizations taken care of and any kind of wellness screenings that they get. So um, we do uh, have that available to them. Um, did you want me to go ahead and give any other updates as well during this time? Yes. Yes, please do. Okay. I did just want to uh, give a little reminder to uh, our physician groups that we do have a tool available on availability for uh, questions or disputes around any kind of financial recoveries uh, that would come out or any kind of overpayment alerts that you do receive. It's a wonderful tool and actually cuts out you having to go through customer service for any questions. It actually sends your questions directly to our uh, payment integrity team. Uh, you can uh, review the remit around that. You can ask any questions that you have around uh, the reasoning behind that or any kind of um, regulations that we're applying around those uh, recoveries or overpayments that we're alerting you to. And it actually does have a chat feature where you're actually going to be chatting directly with that team. So you're going to get a lot better uh, feedback and a more intelligent answer, I think, than if you were to reach out directly to me or through customer service. So just wanted to remind everybody that that is available to you. I think it's a wonderful tool. Um, I think it expedites uh, the process for you. And certainly if you have a dispute that um, is definitely uh, something that we would need to overturn for you. That's going to make that faster for you to and avert any kind of uh, recoveries for you guys um, that would be overturned. So just a reminder that that's out there through the availability tool. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Um, outside of that, we don't really have any changes to our processes. We're still uh, in effect with all of our current COVID practices and the allowances around that. Um, and just happy to have you guys out there with your boots to the ground, uh, continuing with the efforts around making sure everybody's unionized and, and doing what we can to get things back to normal. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up will be Will Care, Johnny Akers, slash time. Johnny, are you on the day? Is somebody else on for well care? All right, no report for well care today. Uh, next, we go to Aetna. Uh, Becky Markham was last time, and Becky, let me say that was an excellent report you gave last time. You all have a lot going on. Not to give you any pressure about how good you have to do today or anything. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. 
I got background noise. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're fine. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike, for that. I appreciate that. Um, our uh, vaccine incentives are going to end June 30th, 2022. So it's coming up that it, it will end for Aetna members and providers. Okay. So, and then our update is for starting, it started May 1st, 2022, under the guidance of Commonwealth of Kentucky, uh, our PAs are going to start going back into effect. So, Aetna Better Health of Kentucky will require PA for provider types 93, provider types 12, and um, also they will require a PA for outpatient service procedures at, the, at other outpatient facilities or other Medicaid services based on their utilization management program, except for individuals with a COVID diagnosis. Uh, a PA will remain in place for all pharmacy benefits and products listed on the physician administrated drug list. Um, to facilitate provider payment requirements for pre-authorization of non-Kentucky Medicaid enrolled providers will remain in place. And PA for Medicaid covered substance use and behavioral health services continue to be waived. And um, that's all we have. Okay. All right. Thank you, Becky. Ne next would be uh, Shelly Fife with uh, Molina. And uh, uh, Shelly Molina is one of the three that services have already expired. <clears throat> no, actually, they go through, <clears throat> I apologize, they go through June 30th. We extended that, and that is also subject to change depending on where we're at with our numbers. Let's see, our incentives can still be claimed by anyone who's eligible to receive the booster as defined by CDC. And <clears throat> they must have passport by Molina as primary coverage. And it just kind of goes down the line from there. And only one reward per member can be claimed. I can uh, send those notes over to you, Mike. Just uh, well, that, uh, That's one reason why we want to update this uh, uh, that we have, because it shows under this that incentives offered through March 31st. Yes, uh, sir. This, this is Dr. Tom James on the team. This is Dr. Tom James, I'm the Chief Medical Officer. And Shelly, I want to give you an update that is maybe a half hour old. Uh, our, our market president, Ryan Sadler, and I have agreed that we will continue the, uh, the benefit and review on a regular basis, but at least expecting it to go to October. Because we want to be prepared for a fall uptake, uptick in, in COVID. That's great. Thank you. And Shelly, you, get, I'll get that to you in writing. So you got it for your- Awesome, question. thank you so much for sharing that. <clears throat> Shelly, would you like to go ahead then with your update? I can. So we um, have introduced a Care Connections program this, this last fall. The goal of the program is to meet Kentucky members where they live and work by offering home visits, mobile clinics, community-based pop-up clinics, and telehealth virtual visits. The purpose of our team is to coordinate care and facilitate communications between members, their primary care physicians, and care management. This team is also responsible for accurate and comprehensive documentation of member diagnoses, as well as addressing HEDIS gaps in care. We're not trying to take anything away or we're, no claims are going to be filed from these meetings. It's more or less just trying to help members get to their appointments, make sure that they're being taken care of, making sure that they're seeing the specialists that they need to see and uh, medications that they need to take. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. Then last would be uh, uh, United, which is also one that shows that their uh, uh, incentives have been expired through December 31st of last year. Uh, so maybe you can update us on that. That was uh, Dr. Cantor. Yes, hi there. Um, thank you. Actually, our incentives for COVID-19 vaccination, the full vaccination, is extended through the year end of 2022, December 31st of this year. And it's a $100 gift card to be fully vaccinated. It does not include the boosters. The goal is to, uh, to still promote that. We also have mom's meals for uh, 14, 14 meals 
if you get fully vaccinated with the COVID vaccine to the end of Q2. That gift card that I was mentioning, the $100 gift card, that's for anybody ages five and older if they have United Healthcare. And um, that's our update for the COVID vaccines. In terms of other updates from UHC, just a reminder to our providers that to be able to check the network news on the provider portal for any codes that might be changed to the prior off list. And what recently came up is something like the hyaluronic acid injections that has been added to the PA list and um, eSTEM. So it's perhaps not always to the primary care physician, but a general reminder to, that those updates are made on the provider portal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stuart Cox, were you wanting to uh, uh, update on Anthem? Yes, sir. We do have uh, we do have an Anthem update on the COVID vaccination. Uh, we are prepared uh, at least through December 31st of 2022 to continue the member uh, uh, vaccination incentive and the provider incentive. And we'll continue to monitor and accept feedback. Uh, uh, look forward to feedback from the TAC on uh, that as well. But uh, we are definitely planning to sustain through 2022. All right. Uh, did Anthem have an update? Looks like I've missed calling on you all. Um, yes, this is Rachel. I'll provide the update. Thank you, Stuart. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Stuart. Uh, hi, this is Rachel Buchanan with Anthem. I do have um, one announcement that I'd like to share. This is about our tobacco cessation program. Um, Anthem's working with the X, that's EX program by Truth Initiative, uh, which is a digital platform built in collaboration with the um, Mayo Clinic to assist patients in quitting tobacco use. Uh, the program offers such resources as a personalized quit plan, um, social support from an online community, coaching from tobacco treatment experts via live chat, um, and nicotine patches, gum, and lozenges delivered to the member's home. Um, this tool can be accessed from a smartphone, tablet, PC, um, and it's offered at no cost to our members. <clears throat> There's also communication and a flyer posted to our Anthem website about this. And that, that's all I have today. Thank you so much. That, yeah. that ends the uh, updates from, from the MAC uh, at this, I mean, excuse me, updates from the MCOs. At this time, let me revisit the recommendations uh, to the MAC. And we, and we talked about the uh, uh, situation with dental. Uh, do you have specific wording that you would like to do on that, Rainer? Yes, I've been working on that while I was listening to the other reports. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to rec recommend uh, that we ask the MAC to support a recommendation from the primary care TAC to the cabinet and office of health policy for review of current dental workforce shortages, including the use of dental auxiliaries to expand capacity in Kentucky. That's the first part of the recommendation. Okay. And in other words, I'd like the TAC to recommend the review by the cabinet and the Office of Health Policy of the current workforce situation. And I'd like to ask the MAC to support that. All right. Comments from the uh, uh, committee members? Could we get a motion on, on whether we want to make that recommendation? I move that we recommend that. Motion made, is there a second? This is Chris, I'll make the second. Chris has made the second. All those in favor of the recommendation to the MAC is uh, uh, read by Rainer Mullins, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, motion uh, carried. We will make that a recommendation to the MAC. MAC. Yes, I'd sir. like a second recommendation. All right. That the primary care tax 
recommend this policy review should include one, current dental enrollment levels in state dental colleges, two, equity in dental reimbursement in state Medicaid and managed care programs, and three, integration of dental services into public health departments, hospitals, school health, primary care, and rural health clinics. In other words, I, I, I think we should ask for a comprehensive look at this that includes dental enrollment, dental reimbursement, and the integration of dentistry in uh, appropriate settings. I think that uh, um, that's in the spirit of what we talked about. I think right. Should they be should they be looking at uh, uh, revisiting the policy of how many out of state slots uh, would be available? Well, I think if you get into looking at enrollment levels, you get that's what that includes, Mike. But okay, okay, yeah. Uh, Not only that, it's the total enrollment numbers. It's the out-of-state, in-state mix. It's the uh, applicants from rural, under you know, rural counties, proportion, sure. the pipeline, pipeline issues. Those so things. Would all. you like to go ahead and make that uh, in the form of a, a motion to uh, uh, approve that to be uh, presented to the MAC as you as you read it, uh, Rainer? Okay. And is there a second? Well, do you want me to read it to be a little more specific? I realize it's a little long, but I think it's complete. Well, uh, and, and I'm uh, gonna have KPCA to write it up and then circulate it among us and make sure that we've all uh, okay with it. That, that, that'd be fine. I'm happy to try to send it along uh, the draft. Uh, I move that the primary care tech recommend a, a dental policy review should include current state dental enrollment, current, I'm sorry, current dental enrollment levels in state dental colleges and loan forgiveness options for dental graduates. Two, equity of dental reimbursement in state Medicaid managed and managed care programs. Three, the integration of dental services in public health departments, hospitals, school health, primary care organizations and rural health clinics. Here. Okay. That's my then, and that's in the form of motion, right? Yes. Okay, is there a second to that motion? This is Chris, I'll make that second again. All right, motion made and second concerning the uh, recommendation to the MAC. Uh, all those favor say aye. 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 All, all those opposed, same sign. Uh, motion carries. That moves down to uh, new business confirmation chair to a, a number six confirmation chair to attend MAC meeting uh, May 26. And uh, I will be attending that meeting. And the next meeting is item number seven is set for Thursday, July the 7th uh, at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And that is all that I have on here. And I've held you over a few minutes. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? This is Chris. I'll make the motion. Okay. I'll send, and Mike, I'll send along some draft. Uh, okay. Draft that'd of be this great. to be more precise on it. Okay. That'd be that'd be great. We put you, you know, here in a few minutes, so I apologize for that. Uh, motion made by Chris and seconded by Raynard to uh, uh, adjourn. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Okay. Have a, thank you all for being with us and sorry about getting a little bit of a late start there. Have a wonderful day and God bless you. Thank you, Mike. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.